Tyler Smith on the podcast today. How are you, sir? I'm good. Good. Good to see you. Good to see I you. I mean, what I can see, you're camouflaged in with a chair today. Yeah, I was supposed to be a deer hunter for uh, the Ye Apparel podcast episode, so. A deer hunter. A deer hunter. So I had some binoculars, too. So. Was it just what you put on this morning? That you're like, well, they're so the last minute, like what we're supposed to do. And so I think they told told me last night we're going to dress up as something. I was like, I don't, I'm not going to go to the store. I don't have anything. So this was authentic and real. Yeah. Do you deer hunt? I do. Do you? Do you I like, do. do you like bow hunting or do you like yeah, bow? I just got rifle. into bow hunting. I, and, um, I was actually just at the ranch out at mom's place this past weekend, filling the feeders and mowing and planting, um, some wheat oats and winter peas and that sort of thing for a food plot. Now we just need rain. But, um, yeah, I love, it's a big passion of mine. Bow hunting is hard. Deer hunting with a rifle over corn is easy. But bow hunting... Because you know where they're going to be and when, typically. You train them to come in, right? With the corn, yeah. Yeah. A lot of people like hate on that, but in Texas it's legal and why not, right? Why not? But bow hunting, yeah, I've tried it two seasons, I think, and I I think I've missed like three times and hit nothing. (laughs) It's, It's tough. You have to have a lot of patience for bow hunting. Yeah. But you seem like the one that would have a lot of patience for it. I do, but it's just, it's, it's, it's a new world for me. I'm trying to still trying to figure it out. They, um, I have a tripod. And so when I stand, I got to stand up in the tripod to draw. And obviously if you're standing up and you're trying to hit a deer that's 20 yards away, they're obviously going to see you. Yeah. It's tough. Even with the camo on. Even with the camo on and 12 they, feet up. They see the weirdest things, man. I've just, yeah. I've, I did a little bit of, I, I don't even call it really hunting. I sat in a deer stand twice when I was like 10 years old or something. Mm -hmm. But I remember walking to the deer stand, pitch black, you know, it's super early in the morning and hearing a deer. Like I felt, I feel like I felt his breath on me. I heard him. that or a hog. What? Oh, it could have been. Hogs are scary, man. I've never been hog hunting. Have you done that? Yeah, but not, yeah, I have. I've shot a lot of hogs in my life. But, um, yeah if you're in a brush blind and it's early like before the sun comes up and you're just by yourself in the middle of nowhere and you hear them you could because you can hear them start doing their pig stuff you what's know, rummage, pig stuff what is that <laughs> just rummaging rummaging around yeah. and and looking for food and oinking you know and they come if they come in packs yeah. like 20 20 of them it's it's a little scary it's like do i have enough arrows or do they have ammo? tusks yeah do the, the wild hogs yeah i've never done any of that yeah, it's fun though. I'm a borderline city boy. I think. <laughs> Me too, but we all got some country in us. Exactly. All right. You're a, you're the middle kid. Yeah. Granger's the oldest. Parker's the youngest. Yeah. Do you have the? I uh, was the youngest for a while though. Well, that's it took true. a while for Parker to come around. What's the difference between you and Parker? Uh, the ten years. Ten years between you two. So I was ten, about to be ten when he was born. So you really don't have or didn't have the middle child syndrome thing, right? I don't think so. I don't know what really what that is, so I don't think so. I read about it that it's the oldest is like the leader, you know, so he has to he leads the 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 younger ones. The youngest gets by with anything because they've already done everything. The middle right. one is still trying to find their identity. Right. And I don't, I don't right. feel like you're like that. No, I don't think so. And maybe that was cuz I was I was I was the youngest for so long. The 10 years helped out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so 10 year how how much between you and Granger? Uh like four so he's 14 years older than parker so you were a freshman when he was a senior or did he you're a Granger? freshman when he graduated yeah i was what was I? I think i was eighth grade when he was a senior okay yeah so you started your freshman year he started his freshman year in college yes yeah yeah i know he went to uh granger went to a m you went to rice i went to rice yeah what was your major economics hmm. what were you gonna do with that I didn't this. know what the heck I wanted to do business and they didn't offer too many um, majors or degrees. So I just economics was like, ah, oh, this sounds like business and I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. it you was, played football though tough. too, right? I did. Did you at Rice being a D1 athlete, did you have like tutors and stuff? We did. Yeah. I mean, did I utilize them and stuff? Probably, Probably not, not nearly like as much. I just tried to get by yeah. to be honest. And you did. And I did. Did you did you like playing in college football? It was it was short story. It was a tough transition coming from a high school where we were used to winning state championships. That was the standard, and you were the man. Going to a school that 
I found out pretty quick. I was like, is my passion really football or was it winning or what? Cause we didn't win in college and it was, you go from being the stud in high school to, to the bottom of the depth chart, right? Cause there's seniors and juniors playing You're ahead of you over. and yeah. starting all over. And it was a tough transition, but I, at the end I, I ended up really appreciating it for what it was and what the degree actually meant getting one from rice. Um, it was one of the best accomplishments of my life was getting that degree. Yeah, that's a big deal. I mean, I didn't finish. I didn't finish college. I I got into what I wanted to get into, which was the reason I was going to college in the first place. And you didn't have to have a degree These to be days in radio. you don't. No. You don't. You're just going in debt right out of the gate. Man, that is, you know, I have, I have uh, now I have an 18-year-old who balanced that, made that decision this year. She had to decide if she was going to, and we, we help out too, but we're not paying for all it. We're not just, you know, yeah, going good. down a chunk of a chunk of money for to go experience college life. Uh, she was going to have to be in, involved as well with a huge chunk enough to feel it. And she actually she made a really wise, I thought, really wise grown up decision to go. Maybe I shouldn't be in thirty thousand dollars in debt my first year in college. So what'd she do? She went to community college. Where took one? all the same classes? ACC. Nice. Yeah, at paying a 30th of what yeah you know she would it it's Texas something State. to do yeah you know when you're that young figuring figuring you know not many people know what they want to do at that age yeah. figuring out but what you want to do but it's do you want to do that while you're i don't know it's an open conversation i feel like these days where in the past it was like a standard where like you're going to college i know? do like though the the whole deal of you're going to prove that you can stick with something yeah get a I agree. piece of paper and a degree I don't like that it I costs agree. so stinking much. Yeah, there was obviously some struggles and stuff. It was tough to to finish, but I finished, and that was the most important thing. It was like I said, I was going to go do this, and, and I did it. So, when you were playing football, there, would you play what position? I played um, like a hybrid safety, kind of in between a linebacker and a free safety, strong safety. You said you started at the bottom. Of course, you're at the bottom of the depth chart. Uh, did you get to a place in there where you did you play all four years? I didn't play all four years. I played two. Or ended up, I, okay. I stayed on scholarship all throughout. Oh, cool. Stayed on the team, but I ended up my friend. I got redshirted, and then I ended up rotating in first string my freshman year, um, which was fun with two other guys until um, I got hurt. But I did get like I did play a lot of special teams as well, and got like special team player of the game like against when we played hawaii in hawaii which was fun so you get to travel to hawaii do you go early for that do you go like a few days early we did we went like a week so, early yeah. and the the when we were there they happened to be doing the hawaiian tropic um international model um <laughs> oh, just contest horrible. Just at, horrible. at our hotel <laughs> so the coaches i'm sure were like giving us curfews and kind of like great here we are with these 18 19 year old kids with this going on when they're supposed to be focused on a game but did you win the game um do you even remember that part? i don't remember if we did or not i didn't i got the special teams player of the game i don't that's cool though. hawaii was good back in the day i don't know how they are now but they were good they had some of those crazy good quarterbacks in that spread offense they have a lot of i mean it is it's uh samoa america right and that is that the proper way to say it like Sounds there's a lot right. of Samoans, Sounds right? right? Yeah, yeah. Family members that, that play football there. And man, they're they're a different breed. Yeah. I mean, they just are. like they're rough. Well, and they're raised that way. That Samoan family tradition. There's a lot of to, trash talk in that game. Oh, I bet. A lot. I'm sure they're great and loyal and, and, and all that stuff, but when it came on the football field, yeah, they were they feel very and they you know, they probably are a lot of family, but they if you're even if you're not your family, if you're yeah, a Samoan American, right? Yeah sticking together yeah got your back you got mine it's easier to trash talk when you know somebody's got your back yeah yeah 90 other guys on the sideline ready to go so when you started in college at rice where was granger in his career what was he doing so i started at rice and my fall of 20 2002 a long time ago almost 20 years ago um, so Granger was, I think he, uh, I know he just moved to Nashville. He left Texas A&M after his sophomore year because he signed a publishing deal with EMI Publishing. Okay. And so he went up there and wrote songs and I think he lived there for about six years. I remember we played Duke. Um, 
which is in where's duke north carolina North Carolina. yeah yeah so he came with a buddy drove from nashville to see that show so that was fun to, to know that they're in the stands at some place where i'm a freshman in college and by myself out there what's funny is you said he came nowhere. he drove to see that show which i think we're so used to so he drove to see the game oh uh, yeah sorry <laughs> drove to see the game the football yeah. game so he's living in nashville you're in college so and i'm in houston yeah and you're in houston you, you go to duke to play the game he comes to see you but you guys i mean he's in nashville now yeah, right, he's, he's doing a, his own thing. Yeah. He's trying to be a country singer and star, and I'm trying to be in the NFL, I guess. You know? Yeah. Figuring you finish you finish college at Rice. You have a degree. What are you doing as soon as you get out? Uh, so all my buddies, Rice is a, a very prestigious school, and the people that go there do, you know, doctors and lawyers and investment banking and real estate and all that yeah. stuff. So all my good buddies at the time were kind of jumping into those fields and um, a lot of close friends were doing investment banking in New York and I didn't really want to go to New York, but, um, I had some friends back in high school too and college that w- took the real estate route. And so I, I was like, yeah, I could see myself doing real estate. I think my girlfriend at the time, her dad was a big, you know, real estate guy in Dallas. And so, um, he actually hooked me up. It was in like Oh seven. So that was like the, the recession, right? Just okay. starting. So I remember like nobody was getting jobs at that time. It was really tough, even coming from Rice and all the connections that I had. But I ended up getting a job um, doing underwriting loans for commercial real estate at Compass Bank. So it's not, when people hear Compass Bank, they hear, they think like the teller, like the drive-through stuff. Well, it was like the corporate big building. In a tower, not in a tower. In a tower, underwriting loans for like Target and shopping centers and big deals. So like if, so there's a new target going in right here by Yee Yee Farm. So yeah. they want to build, they come to a guy like you. I was the one underwriting and crunching all the numbers. Front the money. Yeah. And, yeah. and then giving it to the, you know, the, the managers above me, the relationship managers and all that stuff, giving them all the numbers. And man, I hated it. You did all the hustle work. <laughs> I oh, I bet. It. Yeah. It was, I was it's in a, a grunt work for them, right? Yeah. On the money side. I was in a cubicle, you know, <sighs> and, uh, kind of like college I was like I didn't really study I didn't really care I didn't want to do it and so I was passionate about music and kind of I went through college I was kind of helping Granger do stuff booking shows in between classes and practice and what would you do to book show like at that time your very first show yeah I still I actually still have the journal that I wrote like I mean, we could talk forever about it, but I would just basically cold call everybody in Texas because there was a scene and still is a scene in Texas where you can play. And um, you say you would cold call people, though. I mean, would you cold call a club? Just a random. I would literally just find a club on the internet and dial the number for the club, and then some bartender would answer. And I'd say I'm looking to book, you know, Granger Smith, and um, nobody knew who he was at the time, so. most of the time, 99% of the time, it was a no, we don't know you, but sometimes we'd get a show and, you know, we'd be lucky to get a case of beer and maybe like 200 bucks. Would you negotiate play like a three hour set? Yeah, I would do all the negotiation. And basically my goal with all that was um, just to get them in there. Yeah. And knowing, having confidence that I would go to all the shows. Well, I guess not when I was in college, but I would try to during the summers, but I would go say and introduce myself and say hey i'm tyler i'm the one that i booked the show i'm doing selling the merch and managing them and booking them and doing all this stuff and i would i had confidence in myself that i could create a rapport and relationship with that guy the buyer whoever was responsible for bringing bands in that even though nobody might come to the show if i called him again he would answer and be like oh i like tyler we'll give you another we'll give you another show yeah and it kind of started that way and so you would do this in between classes. Like say yeah. you had you had a 12 o'clock, you're off two hours, supposed to be studying. I would go to like the library. And book a show. Yeah. Or try to. Yeah. Cold call these people. So he's in Nashville. Why were you booking stuff back here? In well, that it's been so long that some, sometimes the years get. Um, yeah. Everything overlaps, right? I think so. I think he came back right when I was finishing. So I was starting to book like in 06, 07. Yeah. which is, I think, about the time that he came back to Texas and decided to start a band because cool. he could answer better. But the way I understood it, Jason Aldean and him were buddies back then, and Jason was just getting started. And Granger played steel guitar in, in bands and just kind of around town. He also sang and did all that. But 
He plays steel guitar. Played steel, and Jason needed a steel guitar player or wanted one. And the liked Granger and said, "Hey, I'm about to release like my first single. I uh, just got signed by a label. Will you come be my steel guitar player?" And so Granger at that point realized, "Do I want to be a member of a band? Yeah, and go tour with this guy, or do I want to be the singer?" And so he said, "I want to be the singer." Packed up his stuff, moved back to Texas, and started a band. Wow! Yeah. I don't think he and I have ever talked about that before. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. And so he comes and back. Then Jason here. Aldean didn't do anything. He just no. kind of still flopped. struggling. Still, yeah. yeah. I think he's still doing it. <sighs> yeah, I think he just did some. He did a song recently with a some no name new. God, that's girl. such a good song. Yeah, he and Carrie, such a good song. Really, and I think what they're doing on tour two, I haven't seen it in person. But I think she is a hologram. Yeah, I saw that. Is that right? That's yeah. pretty sick. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, Jason Aldean, Carrie Underwood song, uh, which we're playing on Yee Radio. Awesome. Uh, the uh, okay, so you're booking shows between classes. Mm-hmm. Are is there a point in time you're going? Hang on, people are starting to say yes, and are you going to these shows too? Or, and how much how, was that? You're like your junior year, senior year. That was like my junior, senior. Year. I always had a hand in yeah. in something that Granger was doing. But he was signed, like he was with that big publishing deal, and then he was with a big management company mm. that had some big artists at the time. Still do. They're Red Light Management, one of the biggest, yeah. if not the biggest management company. But um, deservedly so, I should say. He was on the back burner because he was a new artist. But I, I felt like he deserved way more than attention and, and stuff that he was getting, um, which comes along, along with when you're with a big agency or huge management company, you're focused on the Jason Aldeans or the Luke Bryans or whatever, as they should be. But I thought that I could, I could go in there and do so much more than what he was getting. And so I slowly transitioned. I slowly did that in college. I got the job. I gave him a year um, at this bank and I would, be working on the computer at MySpace at the time on his page and all that stuff. And the boss would walk by and I'd like, you know, hide the screen or whatever. But then I quit that job and I knew that I wanted to get into music full time and, 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 and help with Granger's career. So that was kind of in 2008 where I quit everything and just went all in. 2008. You said, this is it. Yeah. Cause you, it, it wasn't just a jump right. Cause like you said, you had been booking shows so you'd started going, this is how you talk. This is what you do. This is how you, how you operate as a manager yeah. and le- and did the bad things and did the good things and figured them out. Yeah, that was it. You learn all the stuff along yeah. the way, just like anything. But I think the most important thing is just having a, a never quit attitude and, yeah. a, and a, and a passion and just a belief. And that's what, that's what gets you through all the good times and the bad times. All three of you have that. Is that something that your, your parents that have what you have that attitude? I don't know. Is it Parker some, had to have it because he was around me and Granger, but <laughs> and he's well, it, it, but for real, he yeah. learned by example. He yeah. saw you guys fail and he saw you guys succeed. Yeah, and how you persevered through the through the failures. Yeah, so I could see that. Did is that something you got? Uh, dad show you that? Mom show you that? Yeah, you know, I I think it was. You know, they say your most impressionable ages, I think, are between like two and eight or something like that. And so, yeah, I just you parents are such a, an important part of raising you know sons and daughters and back back then i you know I, I didn't know what was happening but they were obviously great role models and raised us yeah. right you know yeah what's uh do you have a good story from a from a horrible booking um one Early popped on. in my mom my mind yeah. um i'm sure that there's a million but we played or we didn't we didn't play it i tried booking this place oh i got another one too but I tried booking this place for years and they never answered, never got a deal done. And for some reason, I don't remember the details, but I never got it done. But the guy called me the day of when he thought we were supposed to be there playing. I was like, what are you talking about? Like we never confirmed. And so he, he thought we were coming. We didn't, we were somewhere else. For a second though, did you feel like, oh crap, I booked something? And I forgot to write it down or I forgot to put it on the calendar. Or I, for, I, I, was, I, I was so diligent with my yeah. note. I knew. Yeah. I, I knew that we didn't because I had everything. That's all I did. You know, I was just psycho about it. But another quick one is a buddy of mine lives in Oklahoma. He texted me the other day and said, hey, I won't name any names. But he said, I'm sitting with 
my buddy out here, he owns a bar. He'd love to have you sometime. And I was like, dude, <laughs> I literally tried to book Granger for 10 years at this place. This guy, maybe he answered or emailed once, but I mean, I to my 100 emails and calls, it was zero to one. Nothing. And I was like, now he, after we've playing arenas and stadiums, now he wants to come back and say, come back and play my club. I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> I tried so, so, so many stories like that where, you know, and that's what's so cool about having people that gave us a shot in the beginning when nobody should have. I'll always remember that, you know? Yeah. I wonder if there's any, is there any pride in them <laughs> to call? Like, is it, do they think before, man, he's not going to remember us. He, they play so many shows. He's not going to remember me. So I'm just going to go ahead and call and ask or text him. I got ask. a good memory. <laughs> exactly. But uh, do you think that they think that? Well, I told him. So I, what I tell people now is I don't, I don't book shows now. Like we have yeah. William Morris agency and we have an agent. And so I always tell people, I'm like, sure, we'll play anywhere. You just got to go through our agent. And so they go through the agent. And if they bring an offer that we're not even going to look at, they won't even make it to the system and I won't ever see it. Yeah. So it's like, it's, you got to go through them. And then if it filters through and all the terms and agreement and all that stuff is right, then the agent will come to me and call me and say, do you want to do the show? So, and I say yes or no. So it's got to go through a series of steps to get back to me at this point, which is great. Cause I don't have to deal with the whistleblowers, you know, we had, a. uh, uh Logan on Logan Mize. I know you know Logan. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's played a few shows with Granger before, and uh, he uh, speaks very highly of you and Granger both. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, he uh, he was talking about one show where he did that uh, that he would just get the door, and when they finished up at the end of the night, it was like five dollars a person. It only held six hundred people. They were like, he goes, it was fully packed. They handed us six hundred dollars at the end of the night. Mm. Have you ever had to deal with? with a club or a, a place like that yeah man all the time uh gosh i'll start with you know i did that too when i was booking when we st- first started popping and i saw okay we're gonna we're gonna like nobody else believed in us but i was like i see what's happening with the whole earl stuff yeah. when that came along yeah. we booked a sh- uh, show in lincoln nebraska and um again this guy never answered my call for five years finally somehow i got a show and like that like logan i a lot of my strategy was, I was like, look, I know you don't know who we are. I don't want a guarantee. And for the listeners listening, artists get a guarantee versus a percentage of the door, right? So instead of saying, give me $2,000 versus 80% of the door, I said, just give me the door. If So what that meant was if nobody comes, like we're not making money. It doesn't cost it's you to wash. Yeah. You're going to be open anyway. But if we actually bring people, we're actually going to make some money, ten dollar, ten dollar, five dollar ticket, whatever it was. And for them, for the actual bar owner, they're making a ton of money on beer. Yeah, but I, I also would pick random nights that yeah. they're not, that nothing's going on. So yeah. say, give us a Tuesday night. Yeah, you're not nothing's going on. Yeah. If nothing happens, like nothing was happening anyway. Yeah. But if we bring people in, you give us a door, and you're going to make all the alcohol yeah. money. So anyway, this one in Lincoln, Nebraska, we were just starting to. I could see it happening. We ended up selling it out like a six, 700 cap small room in Nebraska. And the owner, it was coupled with, is like the best crowd he'd ever seen there. Plus I think he was like retiring like the next week, but he got really drunk. And so when I I went to go settle up and say, oh, great show, yeah. sold it out, told yeah. you we'd do well. Yeah. You know, what did we make? You know, 100% door. He gave me like like that Logan story, yeah. like nothing, like 500 bucks or. Five, and I was like, "Oh, dude, this isn't happening." And so he he put a gun like on the table. Uh, I didn't know what that meant, but I've I've had a few gun instances at close closeouts. But have you like, really? I was like, "All right, well, that sounds me. like a movie, though." Yeah, that doesn't sound like like that. Oh, oh, dude, you're dealing. They make I, this up. I in used movies. to tell my dad like these stories, and he'd be like, "Tyler, like, there's there's bad people in any business. Yeah, it's not just." True drunk bar owners and clubs like that they're they're bad people everywhere um but so i went and got back up i think i got one person then i got like blake at the time and then got somebody else you know and then finally we finally we got out of there i think we got what we were happy with without getting shot but yeah that was one story dude that's bizarre that there was 
the dude lays down a gun on the table. I mean, what was he going to do? Sometimes we just get money, like dollars, like yeah. stacks, like in rubber band, just yeah. thrown at us. We're like, great show. We're like, oh, wait, we need to count this. Like, we have a deal. And they're like, what do you mean? You don't trust me? I'm like, no. At 1 a.m.? No, you're uh, wasted. No, I don't. I, Asking absolutely. us if we want to do shots. We're like, no, we're leaving. We're, let's settle up. We all have to drive somewhere. Yeah. That's why we're not taking shots right now. Yeah. Wow. You you brought up Earl. You, that's really kind of when you knew things were starting to take off when Earl became viral. And you were very instrumental in that. You were filming them, right? Me and Parker were. You and Parker both were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're the first one to ever say yee yee. Yeah. Am I right on that? You are right. 10 years ago? I said say yee yee. 10 years ago this year? Yeah. And where did, like, what made you say, say yee yee? I mean, wh- had you said, say something else? Had, had you said four or five other things? Yeah. So we did a video every week. And during that time when we were filming the Earl video, it was just another video. We, we, ha- we were driving around in the van at the time and we all, there was, there used to be a fan. I think Granger might have a different story, but I re- I remember there used to be like a crazy fan that would, um, tweet i think ye why i why i just ran like well, what does this mean so it be, kind of became like an inside joke and then we ended up saying changing it to y-e-e y-e so i think at that time it, we were it was an inside joke in the in the band and so i said say ye and he said it and then history was made <laughs> and history was made was it literally that next weekend after that after you put out that video that you saw signs pretty much yeah yeah we because we put out videos every week and they would get a hundred we'd wake up we put it out wake up and have a hundred views like literally yeah but we just knew we had to keep going it, our goal at the time was a million viewed video sounds like this podcast yeah i'll put it out if you do something long like enough 50 man, views something's bound <laughs> a week to happen later. <laughs> yeah but um yeah we put that one out and i think the next morning it had like twenty four thousand views We're like oh my gosh i think we did it and then soon after that, the video of the week stopped because we were trying to capture lightning in a bottle sure. with this Earl thing. So. Dude, that's insane that he, I mean, just one thing you yelled at him, you decided to edit in. And I mean, because I, I went back and pulled the audio because we were using, yeah. we using it on the air on Yee Radio is to uh, sift through the wind noise. It, yeah. was just, it was just the microphone on the camera. Well, I only right? had the left speaker on like if you listen to it on YouTube, the original video, the only right, the left, only the left is mic. working. <laughs> oh, how funny! Yeah, because it was just a camcorder. It was. Or was I, it an actual I DSLR? Think it was a D90 or something. Okay, yeah, yeah. At the time, the one, the kit that you buy at Sam's, probably. Yeah, one of those. One of the first like three versions. lenses in it. Yeah, yeah. That's the, kind of like my first camera too. Yeah, and yeah. we did the we did a lot of the like because the office was popular at the time. It yeah. still is. I love the office, but we did did a lot of awkward like zoom ins, you know. So that was that inspired a lot of the Earl Dibbles stuff. Still does to this day. When did after that you started putting it on t shirts, selling them at shows? When did you go? Hey, what if we did this apparel company and just sold this? Did yeah. that stuff? You know, I know we're jumping from ten years ago the the video that got 24,000 views overnight to now to where ye apparel is. So in that time, where was the decision to go? Hey, let's, let's do some different things than just this one shirt or these two shirts. Yeah. Well, so the first shirt I'm trying to think was either the put a good dip in that had mm-hmm. Earl's face, but the one that said that not many people know, I said, I'm a country boy and black t-shirt said i'm a country boy and on the back it said i would wake up i whittle sticks i climb the windmill like all the stuff that he does in that yep. video yep and then i had a pink one that said i'm a country girl same stuff on the back yeah. those started selling really well and i don't remember when the first video was 2011 music video was 2012 so it came out between 2011 and 13 somewhere in there but it started selling really well enough where a company emailed me a cease and desist letter i don't know if you've ever heard this but a cease and desist letter saying, hey, we own the copyright and the trademark to Country Boy. You can't put Country Boy or Country Girl on any article of clothing, any koozie, anything. Wow. If you continue selling this, we'll take legal action. So I was like, oh, what crap? Like, what do I do? Are you his manager right now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so I ended up talking to my dad 
about it and showed my dad because I think I might have been living with them at the time or visiting or something. And he said, he said, you need to trademark ye because they're doing this to us. You need to protect the ye thing that's going on right now. So soon after that, we went to the legal process and trademarked ye ye. And then um, it officially became a company, an LLC, ye apparel in 2015 when in my mind, we have everything was like was down the music lane, and I wanted to separate and grow something outside of that. Not, yeah. I didn't really, I don't know if I knew the vision and, and saw where it was going. I still don't know where we're going to be 10 years from now, but I knew that I wanted to separate that from the music and the Granger thing and create its own entity that was still connected, it had an arm and a branch to Granger and all these other things that we're doing. Well, and think about what ye apparel meant to all of you guys in the year, year and a half that Granger was off the road because of COVID. Yeah, it saved us. I mean, it was, and if it just been everything, if it everything had stayed with the music, stayed with the touring, it would have. We had no music, money coming in. It'd been going the same way as the except music, except for ye apparel. Yeah. And people were at home, and e-commerce has exploded, and so yeah. people were buying ye apparel, and we're like, God. Oh, this and our and the fans and the customers like saved saved us during that time. Yeah, you can still make a t shirt with a mask on. Do what? You can still make a t shirt with yeah. a mask on. Yeah. You yeah. couldn't go out to a club or go to you know, at that time. Right. When it was it was freaky. Um man, it's it, it, now not only an apparel company, but an outdoor company. Yeah, it's so exciting and I tell lures. I t- yeah, I tell the team all, what'd you say? Lures. Yeah, lures. I tell the team all the all the time, I'm like, yeah, we're it's an apparel company, but we're trying to be yee ye, the you know the number one outdoor lifestyle brand in the world and what does that mean it could mean obviously apparel and t-shirts but it could mean a podcast it could mean a radio station it could mean um you know an energy drink all these things we got something coming up that we haven't been announced yet that we're excited about project x right? project x coming up soon but yeah so i tell the team all the time i'm like what can and it's mainly my job but to think of what could we become that we had, none of us had like had any idea that that would be our number one seller. That's not like a t-shirt or something like cologne. If we do a cologne, which we might do. Nice. Um, Can you wear this cologne while you deer hunt? <laughs> no, probably yeah, not. Got it. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Did you think that, uh, and you told me this when we were, we were talking about, starting EU radio that you guys had talked about doing radio before. Yeah. Why did you not do it before? And why are we doing it? Because now? it takes some, it takes a who uh, yeah, a person. Okay. Yeah. And that person was you like, yeah. I can come up here and, and come up with all kinds of awesome ideas and Granger and Parker can too. But if you, we have so many things going on that if you don't have that person that can help bring it to life, mm-hmm. then it's still just an idea. And so that's what happened when you came on. It's like, it was just, it was meant to be. Well, and it was an interesting conversation because I think I anticipate most conversations, I guess most of my life, I feel like that I've had to sell it. I know what I think about it, but I, it's, it's been hard for me to translate what I felt or thought about it to somebody else with the same and them have the same passion that I had, yeah. with it, you know, and I've never been a great salesperson per se. I can, I can do a pitch. I've, you know, I've endorsed a lot of things in my radio career. Um, things that are only things that I believed in. I never really did anything. I can't think of anything that I ever talked about as an endorser as saying, this is what I put my, my brand or my stamp on that I didn't personally use or, or think was great. But I, so those, which made it easy that when I did want to talk or did talk, need to talk about it, I could, because I really genuinely liked it. Right. Yeah. But I, I'm not the person who goes into a, a business and goes, here's the reason you need to buy ads on our radio station. I, I leave that to salespeople. And yeah. at Yee Radio, we even have, we have a great, a great group of people who take care of those relationships between, you know, the radio station and uh, the uh, the sponsors, the the partners that we have, like Tacovas and, and Canadips and things like that. And some other ones we have coming up. They're great at that because I'm horrible at that. So when I, it started with a text between me and Granger and then it led to a conversation with me, you and Granger. And in that, I didn't, I was like, man, I feel like I'm, I should be selling this more to him, but you guys are getting it. Like you, yeah. you have the same passion if, and, and parts of it, if not more than I do about it, 
what did I do wrong? Because this is not, it's not the norm for me. It didn't feel like the norm that I had to, you know, oversell it to get somebody to understand it and believe in it. It's tough to find the right person. Yeah. And that's why I think when I stopped for a minute, I was like, okay, this feels really good. And this is why, because I feel like they get it the same way I do. I'm catching on the stuff that they're talking about and it's happening. Probably the most organic of anything that I've ever done. Yeah. It's rare to find partners and people that see the same vision yeah. as you do. I feel like a, bu- a bunch of our life and our career has been like, hey, do you want to do this? They say, no, we do it anyway. Right. And then a couple <laughs> years go by and we're still doing it. And they're like, oh yeah, you were right about that one thing. It's like, yeah, I, do. I told you. I know. I told you, you yeah. know. But and it, you know, I grew up, and I think this is what lends itself to, to you guys being so close as brothers because you're not doing it alone. Yeah. You have your older and your younger brother. Parker's not doing it alone. He has his two older brothers. Granger's not doing it alone because he has his two younger brothers. You know, I I was kid number five of four girls that were all gone. So it's just so solo. It alone. <laughs> so it's just figuring out. And it's been cool to, you know, in, in this sense and on the radio side, to be adopted with you guys, to be partnering up and working with you. And it means a lot to me to have guys that, that, I feel that have my back on the radio stuff and know that I do too and just adds to your number. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fun to continue to grow and add to the team and you find out in any business where like kind of your bottleneck is, Yeah, you know, and then you figure out who you need to bring on to offload some of that, that stuff and continue to grow. And it's all that stuff is scary, but necessary to each hire and each new hire and stuff is a little scary. You know, a lot of people it's the, you gotta have the abundant mindset you know, not, not yeah. the scarcity of like, how am I going to pay yeah. for this? And because obviously hiring the right people and bringing on the right, the right team members just can exponentially lighten the load for you. And just, you know, the growth of the company can go through the roof. Well, if the, the, the phrase Yee is 10 years old this year. First time that Earl said it uh, on camera, how long have you been officially Granger's manager? You know, when it was never like a sit down and sign something, it was just like, it it, it probably when I left the bank in 08, I went, you know, four, literally, I remember my, my bank statement at the time was like four cents, (laughs) 0.04. Um, (laughs) been there for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just went on the road with him and, um, that time he was back in Texas getting going. And so I sold merch, um, tour managed managed book shows did everything but play on stage for the most part actually i did play on stage one time did you really would you play our keyboards do you know but are you good at keys i don't know how to play at all are you serious our keyboard player was sick we we're playing in houston and um i don't know why like why they i think maybe there was some track stuff yeah we ended up tracking it obviously but i got up there and just acted like i was playing the entire 90 minute set that's hilarious. Do you think how many people you think knew? I don't think anybody, anybody knew, knew, man. It's on a track anyway. It was so man, weird. It's good. It was Sounds fun, great. Though. Do you have uh do you play anything? No. I don't. Nothing. I don't. So we've seen we've seen Parker on TikTok. Yep, he's yeah. great. You know. Super disciplined. Been been you know He's uh, been doing it for yeah, a long time now, every day. We know Granger does, obviously. But no you sing? I play, I played, you know, guitar. I could, I can play the standard chords, but I, it never. It, AGC. It, yeah. It yeah. never, inter- it, I never had interest to continue beyond. I, maybe that's why I just fell into the business and yeah. business role and management role. We talk about, you know, when we were just talking about the radio stuff, just having the person, you were the person to do the, the business stuff with no, you're not distracted by, man, I got to go practice for 30 minutes or, or do this. Right. Yeah yeah um rehearse for a show yeah i never did that yeah those guys just play guitar all day which yeah. is awesome they're incredible but that's true man the rock um, stars. you ever thought about managing other artists i have and i still to this day think about it you know whether it's an artist or like uh influencer or a mm-hmm. comedian or something all these spaces that we have these days but man i just love my freedom you know i think you know, what's the quote where, you know, your, your time is money, you know, um, I could have all the money in the world, but if I'm slaving away at a job and working all that, I just love my freedom. Yeah. And so it scares me to, if I, if I took on the role of 
Plus, man, just starting from scratch, like, man, I've done that. I'm still like trying <laughs> over here with Granger's yeah. career. Just put so much blood, sweat, tears, and years into this thing um, that it just scares me to start because it's tough to break an artist. You sure. know, people know all the artists they know, but they don't know all the millions and millions that that haven't that are trying that haven't broke through. Do you feel like um, the way music is more on demand now than it used to be is changing that? How quickly yes. somebody gets into that. I, I do, but I still think you need either a hit song or you need some sort of viral video or something mm-hmm. to get that attention. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's way easier now. You're smart sure. to do that. Find find something that, that caught that could be part of the show too, you know, with like like Earl. Yeah. You know, I know there's been other ones. There's been Donnie Cowboy. Well, the, the, do, you the, can, do you consider yourself their manager as well? <laughs> Donnie and <laughs> Dwayne? Not, not yeah. really. And they Earl. haven't asked for anything. Well, but if they make some money, I mean, you could, you could jump in on it. Right? I could, yeah. I could help them out. Yeah, I'll represent you. I could, I would manage them. Yeah. So if it wasn't another artist, you say maybe a comedian. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Cause well, that's something you could also find to package up. Yeah. But it's, it's very similar to what we do here, you know, with, with the music booking, you need a booking agent, you need, you know, stages, you need places to perform. Same thing. Do you have, do you have a lot of people vying do you have a lot of ask, I should say, like of your services? I, I had one recently. Yeah, I won't name any names, but um, I did, and I, I still do ran, randomly. Um, and I feel like a lot of times I could I could say, "Hey, I can manage you," and they'd say yes as well. You know? Yeah. But, what about music? You get a lot of music. Yeah. Songs pitched to you. Yes. Yeah. More so when we're about to release an album or. or the publishers know we're going in to cut an album. Yeah. I'll what about just randos? Oh, yeah. Yo, I got to show you one. I got the other day, like last week. Might be a hit? No. Does it need to go on UU Radio? It is funny. No. I'll show you before we leave. Okay. Okay. Because I've got an idea with that then. I feel bad for them because they're serious and they send like a package and like t- type out the notes and like a little a side note like how much this song means to them and they Granger would do great to cut it yeah is that what most of it is is songs they've written they want him to sing so yeah so it's yeah I mean it, they come from all different angles whether it's that way the traditional way though is either um, Granger will call up his songwriting buddies that yeah. he feels comfortable with and he'll write with them that's the number one way besides Granger writing them himself but then I also get songs pitched to me from the all the publishers and my friends out in Nashville Anything that that you were like, you should probably you've gotten hits. We've got cuts from the last every done. album that that were outside that were pitched to us. Um, if the boot fits was pitched to me. Oh really? Um, I heard no that kidding. song um, five or six years ago wherever I was, and I was like, dude, I love this song. And good sent pick. It, sent it to Granger, and yeah, he changed up the words a little bit, and then we became great friends with the writers that he still writes with to this day: the Jordan Schmidt, Andy Albert, Mitchell Tenpenny, yep, all those guys. Mitchell's a big part of UU Radio. I mean, we play a lot. He's of his the man. Stuff. I yeah. love Mitchell, and he's the best. He'll he'll dude. sit here and say that, you know, because of it, the, if the boot fits, and maybe it's, there's some truth to that. But I, he's just an incredible talent, and he was going to make it no matter what yeah. happened. Yeah, he writes a lot. So, yeah, a lot of good stuff. What? So is the one you're going to show me after we hit stop on this, the worst one? One of the worst, yeah, if not the worst. Wow, I feel like we almost need to share it. I don't want to call him out. I don't want to call him out if he listens to this. He'll know. Let's wrap this up by talking about the Bachelorette. Okay. How did that happen? Um, I, I guess it first happened. Granger played. They asked the Bachelorette asked him on Garrett and Becca's season to play. Happens like that at one of the dates, and that was in somewhere in utah it's really cool place so we went out there and granger uh performed happens like that which was a single at the time the couple came in and there was fans there played a show and so anyway i guess i got to meet one or two or three of the producers and so they're booking with you the producers are talking to you to get granger at it right yes and through through me and our publicist and then the label um so my publicist always kind of joked from that moment on, I could totally get you on The Bachelor. And 
I had no interest to do it. You know, that kind of stuff kind of scares me, like doing that, like out of your comfort zone, yeah. all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. like, that's just not for me. But she just kept on and on. And so one day, I remember we were in LA at like an award show and we we're at this, at a pool just hanging out. And she said, I could get you on it. I was like, all right, fine, just do it. Um, so she sent an email and um, connected me with the producer we met that one time. And and I think that was for Hannah's season. Um, was what she pitched you for, was Hannah's season? Well, the producer came back and said, we're, we're booked, we're done for Hannah's season. Okay. Maybe next time. And so I didn't hear for six months. And so then I randomly out of the blue got an email like six months later from the producer and she said, Hey Tyler, are you still single? And I said, yep. And uh, she said, do you want to be on the next season? I was like, uh, thought about it for a while, but I ended up saying, sure. So you didn't have to make the video. You have to all this. Isn't that one of the I things I did that make the video did? the first time, yeah. but then the second time that came around, she just time. said, yeah, I was kind of in and then COVID was happening and yeah, um, oh, that's true. So I had an end on that. I didn't think about that. So you, was it, had it already kind of started or was it right at the front of COVID? Um, I, so I went to go film it in June and July. And, and so, March is really when it yep, shut down. So it was in the middle. Wow. I think they were, the bachelorette that shows on, I think that was the first show back to filming, like going through the protocol, the yeah. protocols they needed to do. We were doing temperature checks and everything and all that stuff we're like in a bubble because once we got checked we're in we still randomly got checked but pro we didn't have to wear the mask i guess because we were all like not didn't have it so you were like in your own little camp though yeah. like you didn't leave that camp no either, usually you? on all those seasons i, I yeah. think they leave and go on these crazy like helicopter and vacations and all that stuff but we didn't we just stayed all at the la quinta in palm springs california do what was your experience like um it was it was great. It was a crazy experience, once in a lifetime kind of thing. You know, I was quarantined in my room for ten days, couldn't leave. This is um, before filming. Before filming, so just for to ten make days. Sure. We got there, we quarantined, got tested every day, kind of thing. Right. Like finally, it, like it was going to fly in the window. Or? I don't know, man. I <laughs> finally got it. That like, yeah. So that was that was challenging, you know, to keep myself busy in the yeah. room, but. Yeah, it was a great experience. You know, I left pretty early, but met a lot of great guys and, and just, just really cool to be a part of it. You know, the biggest TV show in the world. It's kind of like a cool, like I was on that. Would you do it again? I don't, I would have to, it would have to be, I don't know. Would you ever be the bachelor? The one that all the girls are chasing? See, I think if you're on the other side of the fence as, as a, the bachelor as, as a guy on the bachelorette you're kind of there you're one of 30 something guys sure. you know and there's but being the you're being the the guy you you're like the star like the producers are like making sure you're happy and like this is your show that would be a completely different experience would i do it i mean still probably not it's tough to tv's tough you know you you can't you can't really be yourself you know because that wouldn't make good TV. I'm I'm generally a quiet, keep to myself, just work, grind, family kind of guy. Yeah. And so when you're expected to go on TV, the stuff that you see is kind of some outlandish, crazy drama, whatever kind of stuff. Are that they I suggesting you say stuff or do stuff? Um. Yeah. They. I think you know. I went into it. My strategy going into it was, I didn't really. I didn't ever really watch the show. I was like. I, I'm gonna. I want to go into this and be me and yeah. and experience it all for the first time and not have any preconceived who this person is or that or how this works and just be me and just be in the moment. But now that I've been in it and I've seen a couple of episodes of the, these other seasons that have come out, I'm like, man, this is such a game like that you can go in and play. And I'm sure, like me being in the world of music, I know I, it's similar with producers and directors and all this stuff yeah. kind of know how it works you know when i do we do a music video i pick the actor and like let's do them or not them let's put them here like so it's the same way with tv um you know you got to get a villain you got to get the knight in shining armor you got to get the people that are going to do stupid stuff and fight and so is there is it possible to truly i mean there's, there's been a couple that have got married and have stayed married or still married today but is it 
is that just a an anomaly? Is I, it, you think it's hard to find love on a show like that? Both of my buddies that left that show, that one of them just yesterday they broke up. I saw really, yeah. But um, who was that? Blake Moines and Katie Thurston. She was the most recent Bachelorette. They got another one going right now, but yeah. they're cranking them out right now. But yeah. they just broke up. Dale and Claire. Claire was my season. They broke up, but Zach um, and Tasha. So Claire left and Tasha came in halfway because Claire fell for Dale and Zach and Tasha seemed season. like yeah. they're still going strong. And they're still fine. Some of them work. Most of them don't, but some do. Do you think it's just because they f- figured each other out after the cameras were over with and they were like, hey, yeah, this is you are really cool. And yeah, uh, it didn't happen on the show because we're when you're on the show, it's like everything's romanticized yeah. and and you're like you're competing against other guys so you think you should like this girl because everybody else is and cameras are on and you're in these certain scenes and situations and that's not really real life so yeah once once the cameras are off and you're back in the real world that's when it's like oh is this really going to happen that's what i've always wondered because you know i mean they go to these most outlandish places they go to you know these first you're flying private or a helicopter which isn't real life for normal americans you're yeah waiting in line at tsa uh you forgot something back at home yeah. you're mad at the other one while you're traveling together because something that they they do annoys you that would be something i would i would watch because i'd be yeah. like oh yeah that's real. yeah that's a good point you know they should do that they should you know one forgets their passport you yeah know, somebody takes it away i don't know Let's <laughs> maybe it wouldn't be good tv everybody wants exactly. a fantasy world you know Once, yeah and they want to see it where it looks like it's real life yeah I don't know. So you great experience though. Great experience. Fun. Yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, if you take what is, what is perceived to be people just finding love with cameras turned on and just because you have 30 guys walking in like, yeah, I'm going to pick one of these or, or vice versa, you know, these 30 girls, uh, but to actually be able to go do it and go, Hey, I met some cool people. I've made some good connections either for business or friendship. Yeah, that part it probably has to be. Cool. Plus, COVID was going on. Is like, well, nothing nothing's happening do. here. Exactly. <laughs> Let me just go on a vacation to Palm Springs. And you're not approving shows. Yeah, you're not, you're not working on. I mean, Parker's. I, I actually the, for the Country Things album, yeah. I literally approved the artwork for the album. Literally, like minutes before they took my phone away. Are you serious? I was like, yeah, it looks good. No changes. Good to go. See ya. And they took my phone. Here's my phone. Yeah. Wow. Dude, this has been fun today. I, I'm sure there'll be a part two. Thanks at some for point. having me. Yeah, we'll have to uh, some more stuff go down. We'll we'll dig in a little deeper on on a few of these, and also comment. I mean, let us know what else you wanna you wanna hear or see on on or this who, podcast. Who, or who, who we yeah. should get on this? Absolutely. Next. Maybe you, uh, Gringer and I have talked about this. Maybe you should co-host with me, and we sit down with. Yeah, that'd be maybe, fun. I know you're close to Mitchell. Yeah. So maybe we have Mitchell on. Mitchell would be on for sure. And you and I sit down and talk with Mitchell about yeah. stuff. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, but thank you. Uh, thanks for being on today. Thank you guys for listening or watching. Watching. Remember, you can uh, subscribe. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and uh, and the notifications bell, and you'll know whoever's coming up. And we'll try to give you a little heads up on our socials as well. Yee Yee Radio. And if you haven't downloaded the app, I mean, we got we can't go without saying that. If you it's haven't downloaded free, the Yee Radio app, yeah, and it's the best. Like I, I texted Ant Man the other day because there was a new song on there. I was like, man, this band is really good. 641 uh, 641 i was like yeah. i love this song this is great where'd you find them so it'll play your hank your, your hank and, yep. and your george Strait and all the stuff that you're used and to that and that new artist love, jason but, aldean and, and used, the new yeah, artist we'll that jason aldean yeah. but um yeah so yeah lots of good granger music play some too. good stuff yeah yeah 